I think they're just an animal. Yeah, and that's a fair answer. Do you think uh, Do you think one should be shot and brought in? No. No, I don't. Even if we would have had a gun, it would have had to attack us before either one of us would have shot it. I don't think, you know, one should be killed. Uh, but that's my opinion. I just hate to see it be killed, you know. Yeah, I respect your opinion. Uh, I always feel terrible because I have the opposite opinion. You know, when I hear someone like yourself say that, it makes me feel bad. And I always think, you know, wow, that's a good man talking right there. That's the funny thing about this field is it seems like if you have a different opinion from someone else, you can't get along with the other person. And I, I just don't believe in that. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved. Uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. This is Lynn Moore from Dallas, Texas. We're about to go on another amazing journey with Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. We're going to be chatting with uh, Stephen. And Stephen comes to us from Arkansas, northern Arkansas. And he had a very terrifying encounter. He's with his family. And it wasn't quite a roadside crossing. He thought this thing was going to collide with his car. Had his whole family in the car. And uh, so he'll go into that tonight. We're also going to be chatting with Mark. And Mark is actually from Ohio. His encounter took place back in 1984 in uh, Canada. He was out with a friend of his, and they were kind of, his friend kind of lives off grid. And while they were out in the middle of nowhere, they had an uninvited visitor uh, that showed up. Very fascinating account, especially with the behavior around that campsite because it really wasn't aggressive but uh, definitely wasn't leaving if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show shoot me an email my email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com and if you get a chance check out sasquatchchronicles.com you can become a member and get additional shows uh, let's jump into it tonight i want to welcome uh, steven to the show steven thanks for coming on thanks for having me on yeah, I appreciate you being here very much. And I know you had an encounter with uh, your family was in the car at the time, and it took place in northern Arkansas. Uh, if you would, kind of take us back to that moment. Kind of tell us what you guys were doing. Obviously, you were driving, but uh, kind of take us back to that moment and walk us into what happened. Okay. Yeah, it was uh, summer 2014, and my dad had been in the hospital uh, up in Springfield, Missouri, and my wife and I and my kids went up to visit him. We were coming back home, which we had lived in Berryville, Arkansas at the time. And we're coming back down through the uh, Urbanette Cosmic Cavern area. It's around 9 p.m. It's kind of, you know, summer's here. 
9 p.m. is still not quite dark, but you know you still can't make out a whole lot. It's uh, it's pretty heavily wooded area. The tree canopy almost goes over the road uh, completely in a few places. But we're coming through the corners. We get down to about Cosmic Cavern. My wife and I are both scouting the road for deer. Deer really bad that time of year. Um, probably two weeks prior, my my mother-in-law got into an accident where she hit a deer. So we're really, you know, watching out for them. And I'm having a chat with my wife as we're driving down through there. And we kind of come out of the trees a little bit where it starts to clear off there by the Cosmic Cavern parking lot where we turn into it. And so my left side, some huge black mass comes running up out of the ditch from the trees across the lane right up next to the car. And I, I scream, my wife screams. I swerved the car because I just know we're going to get hit, but we didn't get hit. And it was just, it, it happened so fast. It was one of those things where I caught the movement out of my eye. I turned slightly to look and this thing just rushes us. I didn't get a good look at it, just that it was black. I mean, blacker than everything around. And it was, it was a couple of feet taller than the car. I got you. So it was on two legs, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not a tall guy. I'm only about five, five, but standing next to the, it was kind of a, kind of a cross between a minivan and a station wagon. Um, standing next to it, you know, I'm about eye level with the roof of it. And this thing was at least a couple of feet taller than that. And, you know, really the biggest thing we've got around here are deer. And it was definitely not a deer. Yeah. It's, um, you guys don't have a lot of predators there in, in Northwest Arkansas, do you? I mean, you guys don't even, I, I mean, no. Not really. I mean, uh, you'll get the occasional black bear, but they're kind of a rare thing. Yeah, and they're pretty small um, yeah. in that area. Yeah, what did your wife say? I mean, this thing, you guys kind of, as I, coming out of the car, did she, what was the conversation like afterwards? We were both just kind of dumbfounded. <laughs> you know, one of those where we stared at each other for, for a few minutes. I, I didn't even have the wherewithal in me to look in the rearview mirror or anything. I was just, I was just shocked and, uh, she goes, what was that? And I said, I don't know. I think I know, but I don't want to say it. And uh, she goes, are you, you know, are you thinking Bigfoot? And I said, I think so, but I didn't think they were around here. You know, I, I, I watched a lot of Monster Quest and things like that. I saw the Patty film, you know, whenever I was younger. And I, I was kind of associating that with being a, a Pacific Northwest kind of thing. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I didn't ever expect to see anything here. Yeah, there's a lot that goes on. You and I were talking the other day. There's a lot that goes on in Arkansas, but people in Arkansas are kind of funny in the sense that unless you're from there and you know the person, they're not going to tell you anything. I'm sure yeah. if you go online and you look up BFRO reports, you won't find much in Arkansas, but I can tell you there's a lot that goes on there. I get, re I get emails all the time from people in Arkansas that run into them. And it's weird yeah. behavior, you know, to, to bum rush a car like that. I was telling you about the encounter in, I think it was El Paso, Texas, which mm -hmm. you and I both know. I mean, you're talking flat desert. I mean, there's nothing out yeah. there, really. Uh, and the SWAT team members, uh, that same thing happened. I mean, this thing came out of nowhere, and he said, I don't know what to tell you. It was a gorilla, and it bum rushed the car. It was the biggest gorilla I've ever seen in my life, and it bum rushed. They were coming back from training, and it did the same thing to them, except for even in your situation, they didn't hit the car. He thought for sure it was going to hit. I mean, everyone kind of braced for impact and it yeah. didn't, it didn't hit the car. Um, what do you make of that behavior? I mean, what's kind of your opinion? Do you think that's uh, it's bizarre, isn't it? it? It is. I don't know if it's like a territorial thing or if he was just getting angry at traffic coming by or something like that and decided to take it out on us. I've, I've got no clue. Yeah, but that wasn't the only person in the area that saw it. You were at church, and and um, something happened there, too, as well. Uh, do you mind telling us about that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, so that was on a Saturday night, so the next morning, Sunday. Um, you know, you, got, you have weird things happen. Your brain will kind of try to logic you out of it, you know, and I'm going, okay, well, maybe that wasn't what I thought it was. I, I don't know what it was, you know, and I kind of already discounted it. And uh, I get to church and the pastor's wife approaches me and she says, you're not going to believe what I saw last night. Well, I knew she lived around the Cosmic Cavern area and uh, she's got a son who's about my age and 
she's one of those that every time he says Bigfoot, you know, she sighs, rolls her eyes. Oh, great. Not this again. You know, that type of thing has no interest in it whatsoever. Uh, you know, so I jokingly throw out there, uh, did you see a Bigfoot over around Cosmic Cavern about 9 p.m.? And her jaw drops and she pushes me, you know, harder than a 50 some year old tiny lady should. She pushes me back and she goes, how did you know that? And I, I said, wait, are you serious? Like you did? She said, yes. She said, I was driving through around Cosmic Cavern at roughly 845. And I saw this huge black figure standing at the tree line. And I said, well, that's crazy because I drove through there at nine and something rushed my car that was huge and black. So anyways, I, it's it just kind of it, it startled me because this lady who has been so against anything Bigfoot, her first go to is immediately it was a Bigfoot. It was this huge black thing standing at the tree line. Yeah, so, it kind of cemented uh, your experience too as well because here's another person who, you know, doesn't really believe in it, is kind of, uh, you know, skeptic towards it and then kind of ran into the same thing you ran into. I just find that behavior so odd that they would rush cars. You know, I, I know you listen to the show, you hear that where they'll step in front of cars at the last yeah. moment. And that behavior I don't quite understand. You know, for something so smart and so intelligent and elusive, that seems like buffoon type behavior. I mean, deers do that, but you know, deers aren't the smartest thing on the planet either. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, it, it definitely seems weird. What did you think of of Bigfoot prior to all of this happening to you? It's it's one of those things that I've always believed was real. You know, it's I kind of look at it like like animals in the ocean. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there that people say, "Oh no, there's no way that exists." And then a couple of years later, you know, something washes up on the shore of Japan and they go, oh, I guess it is real. You know, we just didn't know. I, I kind of feel like it falls into that category of it's it's out there and it's real. We just don't know enough about it. Yeah. What do you think that they are, Stephen? What's your your own personal opinion? Okay. And again, you know, there's no wrong answer. I'm just curious on after this experience, I'd imagine you, you took some time to really kind of look into it. What, what do you think that these creatures are? I, I've kind of always thought they are what the Native Americans say they are. You know, they've spent the most time uh, in close proximity to them, you know, lived next to them for thousands of years. They refer to them as hairy man. You know, there are people of the woods. I honestly kind of think that's what they are. I think they're maybe an ancient people. They may be a little more animalistic, but I, I really think they're, you know, almost like another tribe. And, you know, you, you, you get some of the stories of the the weird stuff, the uh, the orbs and the uh, the glowing eyes and uh, cloaking and mind speak and all that. I, I don't know. There's there's a lot of physical evidence out there. You know, you got hair samples and scat and footprints and things like that. And then you have these other ones that don't fit in that category. I almost feel like it's two separate entities doing this. Yeah, I've often wondered about that too. It's so hard to pin down what this thing is because. Like you said, in, in some encounters, it, it, it's almost like you're running into an animal. In other encounters, it's almost like you're running into some weird branch off of humans, you know. And Yeah. And there is a weird paranormal side to it that a lot of people talk about, and it's hard to discount that. Um, I used to, until you kind of listen to people, you know, people who don't talk to each other, uh, they all kind of describe the same weird things going on in around their property, your dad talked about the orbs. I'm I'm fascinated to hear what he told you, the, the balls of light. When he talked to you about this, was it in the same area that we're talking about? It's it's about three hours north. Um, he lives up in Missouri, in southern Missouri, and we're in northern Arkansas. But the the property that he lives on is is an old property, and I said that because the, the 40 acres he lives on was part of the Homestead Act. So, I mean, it's it's been what it has been for a long time. There's, you know, super old graveyards and stuff around there. But um, he said, you know, he told me stories before, which he's not – he and my, my mother, neither one, are, you know, paranormal people. They don't, you know, they don't think anything about ghosts or aliens or anything of that of that sort. You know, I, and, like, I wouldn't even bring up this story to him, you know, that I told about Bigfoot. Um, because I know that they would just blow it off, but I, I don't know. There's something about 
you know, Ozark hillbillies that things like orbs, which they call them spook lights, um, you know, spook lights are just part of the woods. It's part of, you know, what goes on out there. And yeah, he, he told me about several instances where, you know, he was younger and living out on the property and it was nothing to see them come and dance down the fence line or, you know, in a, a hay field across from where they were at. He said there'd be, you know, four or five of them come up out there and circle around in the field. And he said they would just kind of sit on the porch and watch him. It was just, you know, part of the area. Did he ever describe describe them to you? I mean, did he ever talk about colors or size or did he ever? I've heard the time, term spook lights before, especially down south. Um, yeah. But did he ever kind of describe what they look like? No, he never went into detail. Uh, the only detail I got was one from my my mom, which there was that account I told you what happened inside the house. And she described it as being about basketball sized with just a dim white glow. Would you share that story or do you mind sharing yeah. that story? No, no, I don't mind at all. Yeah. So uh, um, my oldest sister is is in her mid 50s right now. And um, at this time, she was about three to four years old and she jumps up in the middle of the night, comes running to my parents' bedroom, uh, gets in their bed, and she's going, what is it, Mommy? What is it? What is it? And wakes my mom up, and, you know, my mom, she just goes, just lay back down. It was a bad dream. Don't worry about it. Well, a little time goes by, and my mom said that this orb came floating into their bedroom, and she said it was about the height of if it was like a, like a person wearing a mask, you know, like it was head level, and it comes bobbing into the room. And comes towards the bed, and the whole time my sister is shaking her, going, what is it, Mommy? What is it? What is it? What is it? Well, it's apparently she'd seen it in her room, you know, and then came in there because it bothered her. But my mom said it just bobbed up and down like somebody walking, and it just went right past the bed, into the closet, and disappeared. She said she jumped up, you know, opened the closet door, looked around. There's nothing there. Like, nothing ever happened. But anyways uh, – yeah, yeah, that's story. scary, man. It's scary yeah. not knowing. Um, I'm real curious. Your your dad sounds like the same generation as my dad, and I mean your folks do. And mm -hmm. I'm really curious on. Did your dad ever tell you what he thought the spook lights were? Did he ever give you any information on them? No, I, I mean he would he would just kind of talk ideas, you know. Never really anything cemented. Um, they do live fairly close to the Fort Leonard Wood Air Force Base. So a lot of the stuff that he, you know, that happened around there, he kind of just attributed to the Air Force. You know, he just kind of writes it off as, oh, that's probably some government thing going on. Um, you know, they've had some weird stuff happen around there that he just kind of writes off as that. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I, I I don't know if your dad, your dad probably may not be old enough to serve in World War II or been, he was probably around during that time. Um, yeah, yeah, and, well, he was born in 1940. So. 1940. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, I, I've always wished I, I would have gone back and asked my dad or my grandfather about the Foo Fighters. I don't know if you heard the show I did on the Foo Fighters. Yeah, yeah I did. Uh, um, and I'm always curious on, you know, a lot of that generation is, is gone. Um, there's not very many of them left, but I've, I've always wanted to uh, talk to one of those guys and, or if they'd ever heard anything around that time about the Foo Fighters. Makes you wonder if that's what the spook lights are, because they they seem to have the same appearance. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a very scary encounter, especially when you're with your family and and this happens. Have you guys been back down that road? Uh, yeah, actually, we we travel it quite often. Um, I don't think we've ever been back down through there in the dark though. But I, I don't know. I, I, I'm always on the lookout for something now when we go through there, but I, I haven't seen anything since then. I definitely would keep my eyes peeled. I want to ask you, you guys moved out to this property in the middle of nowhere out there in Arkansas, and there's been a lot of weird things happen on the property. Do you mind telling us about that? Well, we moved this summer. We were we were living in the middle of Berryville, and we moved out to the middle of the woods um, up north of Eureka Springs. And we're several miles down a county road. Like I, I told you, we we're, were trying to get the logistics of the call going, and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to have to call you from town or because <laughs> I don't have cell service and I don't have – available internet that's how far out i am but uh no we were uh we were looking at the property we wanted to get out of town you know get the kids out into the woods we went over went over to do an inspection on the house and so you know my my son he's he's 15 he's like yeah i'll, I'll go with you i want to go check out the woods he's he's kind of an outdoorsman 
He said, I want to check out the woods while you guys are looking over the house. I said, yeah, no problem. So he came with us and he wandered off out to the woods while we were checking things over in the house. And, and uh, he comes running back up to the house. And he's like, you got to come with me. I got to show you something. And I go, oh, OK, I was thinking, you know, you found something cool out in the woods or, you know, I, don't, I didn't know what it was, but I went with him. Got up there and we, we get down into the down to the trees and it's mostly pine trees, you know, a lot of pine needles and stuff on the ground. And he points down. He said, there, I marked, a, marked it with a stick. And I look down, and it is the clearest footprint I've ever seen. And it's about 11 inches long and about 8 inches wide. And you can see toe in, indentations. You can see the front pad of the foot where the weight transferred because it was going up a hill. And it was, it was eerie, you know, to, to see that right in front of you. And uh, I, I had a tape measure with me because we were checking stuff in the house and I got it out and laid it beside the footprint and took a picture of it. I, I can send it to you later if you'd like. Yeah, please do. But, uh, but anyways, that was, that was kind of the first thing that happened. And we, you know, one of those things that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up and, uh, got us to thinking, well, you know, we had that instance happen in 2014. Maybe, you know, maybe there's stuff around here. Um, anyways, fast forward, we get, we get the house, we get moved in. Um, my son's out. He's, he goes out and hangs out in the woods all the time. Well, he went down uh, over on one of the far sides of the property, and there's a, there's a dry creek bed, and he found that there was a spring under part of it. And so he takes the shovel, and he's trying to dig the spring out. Well, while he's, he's digging out the, the gravel in the, in the spring, this baseball-sized rock comes whizzing past him and hits the bank. And we're out there where there's nobody. You know, there shouldn't be anybody else out there with him. But this baseball sized rock comes whizzing past and hits the bank next to him and, and falls down into the creek bed. And he stands up and goes, well, that's odd. Where did that fall from? Well, about that time, he hears a real faint. He said it sounded like a whooping sound down the creek bed from him. And he turns to look down the creek bed. And he doesn't see anything. And then he turns quickly back to look up the hill because this, this creek bed is kind of in a not a ravine, but it's very, very steep hills and, and it's very thick brush. He looks up the hill to see the direction where the rock came from. And when he does, there's a bunch of these little trees. It's, it's like the trees that, um, they grow on the forest floor, but they don't get enough light. So they're, you know, they're really tall, but they're only about an inch and a half in diameter. There's a, there, you know, there's a group of about five or six of these past the brush that he's looking at that all move in unison, like something huge went through them. Uh, he freaks out, you know, and he's he hunkers down in the creek bed. And he always takes a walkie-talkie out with him. And he he's calling to the house, going, going, Dad, come on, you got to get out here, bring your shotgun, come on, you know. And so I grab my my boots and my shotgun and I run out there. I, I get down close to him and he's signaling to me, pointing up the hill above him, asking if I can see anything. And I'm going, No, I'm, I don't see anything. Well, we get down there and he, you know, he gets back up and he tells me where it's at. And I walk up the hill, walk through the brush and walk to the trees that he saw move. And I'm shaking him from the base because he, the brush is so thick he can't see me. And I'm shaking him from the base. And I'm going, is it this one? Was it this one? Was it this one? He goes, yeah. He said, all of those there in that group. And I had him come up there and look. And I stood between the trees and, and stretched my arms out, fingertip to fingertip. And I couldn't touch any two trees. That's how far apart they were. But he said they all moved in unison, and he said it. They did. Uh, they did almost the wave, you know, at the top, like something hit him at the base, and that vibration went up the top. Anyways, that happened, and then he was uh, he was out of the woods for probably about a month. You know, he wouldn't go down there by himself after that happened. It really shook him up. And then uh, and then he got his courage back up, and he decided he was going to go down. Um, he had a friend coming over. They were going to shoot guns and do some target practice. And there's an old abandoned access road on the backside of our property. And he, you know, it's, it's a little overgrown, but it's relatively flat and mostly open. He's like, well, you know, that's a good straight, straight spot away from the house. We can go down there and set up some targets, you know? And so he went down there with his hatchet and he's kind of clearing out some, some low limbs and stuff to where they've got a clear line of shot. And uh, he walks back down the Creek bed to get there and comes out. And as he is, as he's kind of cutting these limbs, he said he heard a sound and I've asked him to try to try to make it for me multiple times. And he just goes, dad, I, I can't make the sound. He said it was a mix between, he said, it sounded like a woman screaming and a whoop. He said, like you hear the recordings of the whoops. He said, it sounded like a combination of the two. He said, it wasn't a low sound. He said it was a high sound. 
And he said a split second after that, a tree got pushed over up there where he had just come from. And it, it freaked him out. And so he came back up to the house and they didn't, they didn't go shooting down there that day. But it's just, it, it, it's crazy to me. Like I, I grew up in the woods. I've never heard a large tree fall over. You know, all the time that I've been out there, you, limbs fall and break, wind, you know, wind breaks things and stuff like that. But I've never heard trees fall over. And since we've been out there, it's a it's a common occurrence to hear trees just fall over. Yeah, that's a little creepy. Usually they don't fall unless there's a major windstorm or you yeah. know, something. They don't just crack and fall over. I, I'm with you. I've been out in the woods my whole life. I've never heard them just fall over. Um, has anything come up to the home or has there been anything else odd that's kind of happened around there since you guys moved? No, in? no, just, uh, like I said, just strange noises, um, trees falling over. But the thing is when we bought the house, the people who had it before us, it was a vacation home for them. So they weren't out there very much at all, a handful of times during the year. So it went from being rarely visited to people being there all the time. So I don't know if that upset something. Or, you know, they feel like it's a territorial thing or what? Yeah, you hear that a lot. I've heard that from other eyewitnesses where they'll have like a home and it's a rental home and no one's <laughs> the last renter left and they have been able to rent it for a year. Then all of a sudden someone moves in and the activity just picks up like there's no tomorrow. And, I, and I'm with you on it, Stephen. I don't know if it's territorial or if it's just why are you guys here? That sort of thing. Have you taken a walk around the property? See if you could find it. I mean, you found the print. I'd love to see it. But have you kind of done a walk around that that big property? I know you're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, we, we have. Um, there's some parts of it that are so thick. I just haven't went through. Uh, you know, yes and no. We, we kind of look look for some odd things. I know that there was a there was one night we heard a it sounded like a big tree getting pushed over. And, uh, and then we heard water. And we've got a, a really large pond down in the bottom of the valley. And I said, that's odd. That sounded like something huge going into the water. We, we take a walk down there and there's this tree that it's partially dead, but there's no wind. There's nothing around it, nothing to cause it to break. And it, I'm looking at this tree going, if it, if it would have broke, it should have broke at the bottom. But, you know, it's eight inches in diameter and it broke about nine feet up. And it, it, didn't fall at the base of the tree when it fell off it fell about 10 to 12 feet away from the tree and half of it broke off and went out to the middle of the pond so like something hit it with some force and up high because it didn't break off the ground it's very there's weird, weird stuff like that and i know i know i've got two uh two australian shepherds that will chase anything day or night it doesn't matter if it's pitch black they hear some noise out in the woods they're after it um, anytime something like this has happened, anytime with my son out in the woods, the dogs are with him right there with him having a good time. And as soon as something, something happens, they're gone and they're back at the house wanting inside. Like they, they get out of the area fast. So it's just, it's kind of creepy. It is creepy. It's very creepy, especially for dogs to react that way. I'd be real careful with your son walking around that property. I mean, you, you never know what's what yeah, how many are out there or what's going on until yeah hopefully they don't come up to the home you know what i mean that's the last oh, yeah, thing yeah. you want is them coming up to the house yeah yeah we just make sure we go out in pairs now if we, if we go out in the woods does it concern you at all having this stuff going on on your property <laughs> it doesn't concern me at the moment because it's out in the woods it's not up around the house i think if stuff starts happening up around the house i i I'd probably get concerned yeah, I would too. Has there been anything else that's happened? No, that's it so far. Um, you know, just like I said, trees trees breaking, uh, sounds down in the woods, things like that. Yeah, I have to. I'm curious about the that sound your your son described. Um, there's a vocal. I have to dig it up somewhere, but it's very close to what he described. In between, kind of a <laughs> whoop and a scream, and kind of a higher pitch. Um, I'll see if I can't dig it up and send it to you. I'm curious if that's what he heard. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, and let me know if anything else happens out there, will you? Yeah, we definitely will. And I sure appreciate you taking the time to come on and and share what happened to you and your family. Yeah, hey, thanks for having me on. Uh, Like I said, my family loves the show. We look forward to it every week. Thanks so much. Welcome 
to the show. Uh, Mark, Mark, thanks for coming on. Thanks, Wes, for having me on. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. And I know uh, you had an encounter back in uh, around 1984, and it's always kind of stuck with you throughout your life and the friend that you're with. Uh, if you would, kind of take us back to that moment. Kind of tell us where it happened and what were you doing and walk us into this encounter. Okay, Wes, um, I live in Ohio. I live about uh, 15 miles north of Salt Fort. And my buddy, he lived up in uh, near Dryden, Ontario, Canada. That's uh, northwestern Ontario in a town Dryden. He, my buddy, he lived off the grid. Uh, he lived 30 miles from Dryden, and uh, his closest neighbor was 13 miles. He had no electricity, no indoor plumbing, no running water. And me and him been been friends since we were teenagers. And um, I went up that, uh, that year, that was in 84, to visit him. And the year before, when I was up there, me and him, we ran into uh, a, an ex-district attorney from Chicago. And he was a real cool guy. And while Bob was working that summer, I would, uh, me and him would hang around, go fishing and stuff. And he was camping on an island on um, a bush lake close to where Bob lived. And he told me that one day, he says, uh, man, Mark, you should have been down here with me. He says, uh, I heard moose bellowing down in the shallows. And he said, I snuck down there and I got to see him. And he said they were feeding on wild rice and stuff. And I always wanted to see a moose. So that year I told Bob, I says, Bob, I want to go camping over on the island there at Salma Lake. And Bob says, no. He says, I ain't camping on Salma Lake. But if you want to go camping, there's a, a lake about 20 miles from here. It's called Buller. And he says, I've always wanted to go out there and explore it. And to me, you know, that was that was good. I mean, we're going to be 30 miles, you know, what, 33 miles out into the wilderness. And so it was a spur of the moment thing. We threw a couple packs together and threw the stuff on his four wheeler and we take off and we get out there and I don't know how long it took us. I mean, uh, so we were driving along. We came up on this little knoll there, and we had to take old logging roads to get back to this lake. And uh, Bob stopped, and he says, look down there below, Mark. And I looked down through there, and as far as my eye could see, all I seen was uh, a light green. You know, the trees, they they were light. It was all new, t new, new trees. There's... Um, pulpwood place there in Dryden and they go in and they cut everything and miles and miles of wilderness just you know cut out and we get down close to it then and the trees were like 15 20 foot tall well we keep going and we come to uh, a little patch of woods and the railroad tracks and Bob says well this is as far as we can drive Mark we're gonna have to walk the rest of the way so we hit his four-wheeler up in uh, that little patch of woods, crossed over uh, into uh, cross the tracks, get up in uh, to the trees. And it's virgin timber. I mean, this was not cut out. This was beautiful. Spruce and big trees. So we walk away and we get, uh, we can start seeing the lake, you know, through the trees. And Bob says, there it is, Mark. And we walk along this ridge because we can look down in there and there's older trees, uh, real thick. And they come all the way back to the, the big trees. So we walk along until we see a little opening down in the alders. So we go down in there and there's a big rock that goes out into the lake. And Bob says, hey, Mark, go see if you can catch us some supper. And he says, I'll go look and see if I can find us good place to go, you know, set the tent up. And I said, sure. So I'm there fishing, trying to catch a supper. 
and Bob, uh, he goes looking. He comes back, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes, and he says, Mark, he says, this is the best place. I can't find nothing better than this. He says, that little clearing, it's big enough to put the tent in. We'll cut some branches out of the road, and uh, and we'll get it right there. And I says, cool. Bob says, if a bear would happen to come, he'll have to come through the alders, and we'll definitely hear him come. And I said, yeah, that's great. So Bob, he was trimming back some of the branches and stuff. I was picking up, you know, some twigs and brush and getting it out of the road. We got the tent set up, and uh, we took six beers along with us, and we were going to drink a couple, you know, after supper. And when uh, we got there, I took the beer and put it in the edge of the lake, you know, to help keep it a little cooler. And we got the tent up and um, got all of our stuff in there, sleeping bags and stuff. And then we went down, was sitting on the rock. We were talking, you know, bullshitting about what we were going to do the next day, how we were going to explore this this lake. And <clears throat> we drank a beer, and the mosquitoes was really bad there. I mean, they were horrible. Anybody that's been in that part of the can- in Canada, they know how bad they are. So uh, we ate supper and cleaned up uh, what food we had left over. We just, you know, threw it out into the lake and we didn't want to try and draw no bears in or anything. And bugs was so bad, we went up and got in the tent and we were in there, you know, listening to the radio. And there's um, a thing that they have on the radio. It's a message thing, you know, for people that lives off the grid you can call in and leave a message. So we had had the radio on, waiting for the message board to start up. And we were laying in there smoking cigarettes, bullshit, and this and that. And the message thing came on, and there was a message from Bob's wife, you know, telling us to be safe, you know, uh, have a good time. She'd see us in a few days. And... We was laying there, you know, listening to the radio. Well, the radio went out. Bob says, shit. He said, I forgot to bring any more batteries. He says, well, he says, that's it. We ain't going to get no more messages. And, you know, we were just laying there talking. And we was planning on getting up early, you know, and get started. And we was laying there. Kept hearing this thing back in behind uh, the tent, walking back and forth. We didn't hear no trees breaking or it wasn't stepping on anything. We kind of figured it was back into the big trees, you know, and um, this kept up. And I'm thinking bear. Every bear story I'd ever read when I was young flooded back into my head. And this thing just kept it up. It was loud steps. I mean, really loud. It didn't sound like a deer or a bear walking. It almost sounded like, you know, a human back there, you know, something walking on two legs. And I kept saying to Bob, what is that? What is that, Bob? Bob kept saying, I I have no idea what that is. And we laid there a little longer, kept walking, you know, and pretty soon, you know, I was scared. You know, I never heard nothing. I mean, loud steps. and. Bob says, Mark, I don't know what that is. He says, if anything comes through this tent, you lay perfectly still and do not rise. And my voice was all croaky, and I said, why? He lit his lighter, and he had a double-edged boot knife in his hand. He says, this knife is going to be going like this, and he was swinging it back and forth. I was already scared. Now I'm petrified. Bob, who had lived up there for years, you know, he had been out camping and stuff in the wild, and he's scared. Now, I'm petrified. And we laid there and listened to this thing a while. We weren't talking, and if we did talk, we whispered. You know, we we never talked out loud, never made no crazy noises, or we was quiet. And finally... I couldn't take it anymore. And I told Bob, I says, man, I can't take it in this tent. I says, let's go down to that rock and get a fire going. Bob didn't say anything. And 
few minutes later, you know, he was thinking on it and he says, all right, Mark, we'll do that. And he dug into his pack. He pulled out a coffee can and a candle. It was a camping candle. That was the only light we had was a candle inside of a coffee can. And Bob, he lit the bottom of it, got it all melty and stuck it in the middle of the can. He handed it to me and he says, here, Mark, you go first. And I says, why do I have to go first? He says, I've got the knife. And that's all to, I know what he meant. You know, he was going to protect us. And I crawled over there, unzipped the tent, took that can shining around. We had a little path that went from the tent down to the lake. And uh, I didn't see nothing. So I crawled on out, stood up, and I took that can, was shining it all around the back of the tent, front of the tent, side. Couldn't see nothing. The older trees, they were they were pretty tall, probably at least 10, eight, 8 to 10 foot. And me and Bob, we were about 6 foot, and I couldn't see nothing. So I took a couple steps away from the tent. Bob, he crawled out. Bob touched me on the shoulder when he stood up, and he says, okay, let's go. And we started slowly walking down to the lake. I mean, I was taking small steps. I was shining the light here and there looking, and Bob was so close, a piece of paper would not have gotten in between us. Finally, we get down to the lake. I get on that rock, and I'm making sure there ain't nothing on that rock, and walk over. There was a, the, that, when we were eating supper and sitting down there, we'd noticed a big pile of uh, driftwood in there. So uh, I handed Bob, the coffee can, and he was holding it while I got a fire going. We got that fire going, and we didn't make a huge fire. We made the type of fire that me and him always called uh, Indian fire. It was small. A white man makes a huge fire. An Indian makes a small fire. Well, this fire was a little bit bigger than a regular Indian fire because we wanted to see what was going on had the fire gone you know it was blazing pretty good lit up the whole rock we was on this rock was pretty good size i would say that rock was at least 15 foot wide and it ran from the older trees all the way down into the lake so we had a fire going we were sitting there you know we were feeling a little better after hearing that thing walking in behind us and uh Sat there. I was smoking one cigarette right after another because I was scared. And we sat there for a little bit. All at once, this radio that had dead batteries in it starts making the weirdest screeching, uh, staticky sounds we'd ever heard in our life. I mean, these things were loud. And we instantly jumped up on our feet. I was ready to jump into the lake, swim to the other side. Bob, he grabbed me. No, Mark, we don't know what this, how fast this thing can swim. Uh, we get out in there and it, it could drown us. I said, okay. And Bob says, you got to go up there and shut that radio off. And I says, what do you mean I got to go up and shut that radio off? He says, well, when the radio first started, like at Bob, he yells real loud, oh, my God, it's eating the old lady's radio. And then he told me I had to go up there and shut the thing off. And I'm saying, why do I have to go shut it off? Bob held up that knife and he shook it around. I've got the knife. And I said, Bob says, uh, I'll go with you, Mark. And I said, okay. So I went first with the coffee can, with the candle in it, looking around. I just knew, Wes, that uh, that creature was inside that tent. And uh, so we get up there. We take baby steps getting up there. We're only probably, I don't know, 10, 15 feet from the lake to the tent. We get up there, and I pull the door of the tent open a little bit and shine the light in there, and there's nothing in there. And... That radio, when it went off, it probably went off making those noises probably a good 20, 
30 seconds. By the time we got up there, the noises had all stopped. So I crawled in there, shut the radio off, and I grabbed the radio, and I took it with us back down. I did not want to hear that radio making those noises again. And so I shut it off and crawled back out with the radio, and we started back down to the fire. This time, I went a little bit faster. I wanted to get back down there to the fire. So we get down there, and when uh, after that radio had stopped, we didn't hear no more walking in behind us. And our nerves is completely shot. That radio really scared the heck out of us. So we go back down there, and I throw more wood on the fire. Everything was quiet, and then all at once, we heard this real loud, shrilling whistle. That whistle, it was about two, 300 yards down the lake. It was on the same side of the lake that we were on. And I looked at Bob, and I says, now, what was that? Bob says, I have no idea what that was. He says, I've never heard a, a noise like that, you know, up here before. It wasn't no more than a few minutes later. That thing was back in behind the lake again, back in behind the tent again, walking back and forth again. Now we're really scared because that thing covered 300 yards in no time at all. And we're sitting there throwing more wood on there, smoking one cigarette right after another. Bob, he wants to go. Bob says, let's go. He says, uh, we'll just leave everything and come back some other time and get it. And I says, no, I says, I don't think I can leave, you know. I says, I'm too afraid. I said, all we got for a light is that candle in a coffee gr- in that coffee can. And Bob says, yeah, maybe you're right. And I says, I think we're better off staying here at the fire. Bob, he finally agreed. And we sat there, kept hearing that thing walk. It walked damn near that whole night back in behind where we were at we never did see anything but it was so brushy in those alders you know you just really couldn't see back in there so this walk back and forth it never broke any branches and you know it never shook any of the trees or anything like that and everything was normal except we never heard no no birds making any noises never heard no frogs no bugs nothing like that i mean it was just complete quiet except for the footsteps and they're heavy footsteps whatever it was it had to be big we knew what it was was uh but the word bigfoot sasquatch was never mentioned at all that night you know we never said anything we we hardly ever talked at all. We just sat there on that rock close to that fire and kept that fire fed. And then we were up all night, you know, we couldn't sleep. And it started getting daylight um, the, uh, in the west, you know, it started getting light. And then we hear uh, the same whistle that we heard the first time. But now it's on the other side of the lake, and it's identical, real high-pitched whistle and noise, and it was gone. And that was it. We never heard no more more from it. And yes. the footsteps, they all stopped, too. Yeah, so the, the first whistle that you heard was from behind the tent, and then as the sun was coming up, you heard that sharp whistle again from across the lake. Is that kind of the way you're explaining it? Yeah, the first whistle, it was straight down the lake from where we were, probably 300 yards or so. The last whistle we heard was going around the lake. It was way from us. You know, it was a long ways from us then. It was on the other side of the lake, and it made the exact same whistle. And you hear them do that whistle. Uh, you hear a lot of eyewitnesses report that whistle kind of as, I guess, a form of a weird form of communication. Uh, you know, I and when I used to work in the lumber yard, they would do that high pitch whistle 
uh, or a uh-huh. whoop, they would do a whoop. And I always thought that was hilarious that they would do that. But the reason was, is, is yeah. you, know, you have all these saws running and something like a high pitched whistle or a whoop uh, to signal break time or whatever. It's just kind of yeah. fascinating that they kind of use that same kind of uh, weird form of communication. What's your take on the radio? I know back in the 80s, they probably had those big D batteries. And you and yeah. I, you and I both know, I mean, when those things are dead, they're dead. They don't, I mean, there's no, I mean, I, I used to have those growing up and when those batteries were gone, they're gone. Um, what's your take on the radio kicking back on? That's kind of bizarre. It was bizarre. I mean, we never, I never in my life witnessed anything about that. I used to fox hunt with a cassette that took double or D batteries like that. When they were dead, they were always dead, you know. And these batteries were dead, Wes. I bet them batteries, um, before it came back on, I bet it was over two hours because we probably laid in the tent an hour after the radio went off. And then we were down by the fire probably for another hour or more. See, that radio, that's the thing that has both of us stumped, you know. Uh, we originally thought that night when we talked about it the next day that it was in there playing with the dial. That's the only thing, you know, we could figure that it was inside the tent messing with it. But if you would have heard them noises coming out of that thing, if, if he was in there, he would have tore that tent up trying to get out of there. And that tent, nothing was moved in that tent. Uh, you know, so, you know, I did when my fear, I never did look to see if it was still on the same station or any of that. And if we did look, you know, it's been 36 years, you know, I can't remember anymore. But yeah, when you mentioned that, when you mentioned the radio going off, so obviously it wasn't on the same station you guys were on, something was moving it. Was it that weird? radio dial sound you know back in the day where you had to manually go from station to station yeah yeah it was it was like that uh uh you know the static and weird noises coming out of it yeah it probably was something like that it probably lasted 20 to 30 seconds like that when it went off um i don't know if it was in there messing with it I would have thought if he was inside the tent, unless he stood up, you know, was outside, because I pretty well reached it before I, I even had to crawl all the way in and messing with the dial. Uh, that's probably the best explanation that I could have. Either that or he was outside the tent and bumped it maybe and caused something to happen or. Uh, yeah, it's still weird though. Those batteries were dead. That's the part that throws me off. You know, and it's yeah. not, they don't just come back or they don't have like a uh, a reserve where it kicks back on. I guess Occam's razor, you would say that would be the case. But what's weird is you'll hear about these Bigfoot investigators that'll go out in areas and they'll have cameras, they'll have different equipment set up, and then everything dies. Their cameras die. And uh-huh. it's it's weird because you'll, you'll hear that in a lot of ghost encounters. I'm not comparing ghosts to Bigfoot, but... That same type of thing happens to where cameras in your battery just magically die. Um, Right. But it's weird to hear of a radio coming back on, you know. Yeah, yeah. What what do you think it was doing? Just kind of pacing pacing back and forth behind the tents. Weird behavior. What's your take on what was going on? I figure, you know, it was curious. You know, it didn't make no threatening moves at us. You know, it didn't throw nothing at us. It wasn't back there shaking on any brush or snapping any branches off. Um, I personally think it was probably a juvenile back there, curious. And I think the first whistle, Mama was trying to call it away uh, because after that radio went off, I mean, it had to scare him as much as it did us. I mean, this was loud, shrill, uh, staticky noises. I mean, real, real loud. And I think maybe he came back, you know, to investigate it again. And that's when Mamba maybe 
was down there making that whistle, trying to get him to come back away from it. But, yeah, and I but, think you're probably right. I mean, it, it kind of sounds like that. that is what was actually going on. It is fascinating behavior, though. I think a lot of times, you and I talked about this the other night, uh, when you go out to areas where not a lot of humans go, generally there's more curiosity than there is aggression. When you go into areas where a lot of humans are known to be, to, whether it's hunting, <laughs> fishing, whatever, uh, there tends to be more aggression. And I gave you the example of Ron Moorhead. You know, they went up to the Sierra camp. And uh-huh. there really wasn't a lot of aggression towards those guys, you know, and I think it's because no one really ever goes up there. And right. I almost wonder if you guys were in a very similar situation. It sounds like you were probably in an area not very many humans have been. Right. Uh, me and Bob that night when we were sitting around the fire, uh, we we figured, you know, we could have been the only white men that ever had seen that that lake. Uh, because we were 33 miles from his closest neighbor. Uh, I mean, we're way out there, you know, uh, way out. I don't think um, they had ever seen uh, people before. And that was all virgin timber out in there, too. Yeah, and, and a lot of people might be wondering about the knife. And I've noticed that with a lot of Canadians. I, I I don't think, I think you need a special permit. I'm sure I'll have every Canadian email me now and <laughs> explain it to me. Yeah. But you don't hear of them going out in the deep woods, you know, armed to the teeth like in the United States. And I think it's different laws. Right. I could be wrong, but I yes, think it's different yes, laws. Yes, it is. You're only allowed to carry a gun up there during hunting season. And you're not allowed to have a revolver or a handgun at all. They're completely outlawed, or at least they were back in uh, 84, because me and my buddy, we talked about that. And he said the only time you can have a firearm out is during hunting season. So that's why we didn't have a gun or anything. He just carried that double-edged boot knife. Yeah, what do you, I know you and Bob have talked about it over the years. Is Bob kind of in agreement with, uh, you know, might have been a young one, kind of just curious on what you guys were doing? Yeah, he he kind of figured that, but uh, we talked a bit, you know. We've talked about this for the last 36 years. I mean, it's always there, you know, in the backs of our mind. And, yeah, he, he thinks that's, probably what it was too but this thing was big Wes it wasn't small I mean when it was walking back and forth behind the tent I mean you could really hear them footsteps I mean they they were pretty loud and it wasn't like a bear or deer walking you know how they kind of dragged their back legs you know you can hear the rustling and stuff yeah it was it was walking on two legs and and I know it wasn't a man because we're uh, 33 miles from civilization. Ain't nobody going to be back in there, you know? Yeah. How did it affect you over the years? I mean, did you ever go back out like that and camp in the middle of nowhere? Uh, I realize it wasn't an aggressive encounter, but I'm just curious how it affected you. Um, no, I didn't. I never went back, camp out, you know, that far back ever again. Um, me and Bob, Bob, he, he talked about going back cause we left two beers there. We figured, you know, we'd leave him two beers and then Bob said he'd go back, you know, later and see if he took them. And I talked to Bob like a year after that happened. I said, do you ever go back there? And he says, hell no, Mark. He says, I ain't got the nerve to ever go back there again. And that was pretty well it, you know, I've been camping, you know, but never, that far back it only really bothered me uh that night uh but it's always in the back of my mind i mean now if we would have seen the creature thank god we never i don't know if i would have survived the night but if i would we would have seen it it probably would uh had a deep effect on me but i kind of wish you know later that maybe we would have spent you know the second night there because I'm pretty sure that next day we would have been able to see it. But yeah, usually I'm, it is. Usually they're territorial. I mean, I think in your situation, I think 
uh, I'm in agreement with you. I think it was curiosity on what you guys were doing and uh, just more curious. I can picture you guys sitting around the fire, though, smoking cigarette after cigarette after cigarette. I mean, oh, you yeah. almost you yeah. feel like a prisoner at that moment because it's not exactly. like you can just get up and leave in the middle of the night. You know what I mean? Yeah, it. we were trapped. I mean, he had us cornered. You know, we were on that rock. The only thing was the lake. And we. the only way out was going back up that little trail we had you know, back up toward the tent because those older trees, they were just too thick down by the lake to even try and squeeze through them. So we would have, if we would have tried to get out of there, we would have probably had to walk right by him. And uh, I think we made the right choice spending the night there because, I mean, we were scared, but it wasn't trying to hurt us or anything. Um, and when I was talking to Bob, there has been uh, Bigfoot activity in a town up there, uh, Kenora. And Bob says we were only like 200 miles from Kenora. So, you know, is it possible that they could have a range, you know, like that? Yeah, I think so. I think that the ranges are a lot bigger than people think. You know, the, I, I told you uh -huh. the other day that one, the only reason why I know it's the same one is everyone describes the same scar, the same coloring, and he's been seen down by the Columbia River, and then he's been seen up towards Mount St. Helens. I mean, you know, that's well over 200 miles. Oh, yeah. In yeah. there, and so it's, um, I think that the range is pretty large, and that's, you know, obviously just my opinion. Uh, what do you think that they are, Mark? What do you think that these creatures are? To me, it's a flesh and blood animal. Um, they're very intelligent, but I think they just, you know, survived, um, you know, when everything else went extinct. I just think they they survived in flesh and blood animal. Uh, I don't think it's any more than that. Uh, you know, I know I've heard people say that they give off electricity, glowing eyes and this. And that would be one way that radio could have came back on. But I just can't believe, you know, that they're that way. I think they're just an animal. Yeah, and that's a fair answer. Do you think, uh, do you think one should be shot and brought in? No. No, I don't. Um even if we would have had a gun, it would have had to attack us before either one of us would have shot it. I don't think, you know, one should be killed. Uh, but that's my opinion. I don't know how many there are out there. I just hate to see it be killed, you know. Yeah, I respect your opinion. You know, it's... uh. Uh, I always feel terrible because I have the opposite opinion. And, uh -huh. uh, you know, when I hear someone like yourself say that, it makes me feel bad. And I always think, you know, wow, that's a good man talking right there. Um, you know, and everyone has their own opinion. And that's the funny thing about this field is it seems like if you have a different opinion from someone else, you can't get along with the other person. And I, I just don't believe in that. Otherwise, right. we'll never find answers, you know. But I, I do respect the fact that, uh, you wouldn't shoot one unless it was coming after you. you right, know, that's uh, exactly, yep. It's a fascinating account. I really appreciate you taking the time, Mark. I know it's been all these years, and uh, it's been a thing between you and Bob that, you know, it happened to you guys, and it's always kind of stuck with you. But I appreciate you taking the time to come on and, and tell us what happened to you. No, I appreciate having me on, Wes. And um, if anybody ever, you know, the – you talk to ever has any idea about what made that radio go on we would love to know because that's the great mystery to me and bob is that radio you know everything else you know we pretty well understand except for that that radio i mean just you know that's pretty well what really scared us that night was that radio I, yeah the radio part's definitely a strange part of the encounter that's for sure mark uh, but I thank you again for coming on. Oh, thank you, Wes. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone. Sure.
Something a quieter, the lights on.